now. Oh, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you all hear me. Just so yes. perfect. So welcome uh, to this course on interactive uh, bioimage uh, analysis with Python and Jupyter, organized by Nubias. Uh, I'm Guillaume Witz. I'm actually from Bern, <laughs> but it's also in Switzerland, so it's not too far. I'm working. Apologies. At the, no problems. <laughs> I'm working at the Microscopy Imaging Center and Science IT Support Unit at Bern University. Uh, so first, thanks to the organizers for setting up all these uh, really interesting courses. I followed a few of the videos and I think it's going to be uh, a great resource for uh, current and future bioimage uh, analysts. So I hope this course will be uh, up to the, to, to the level. Uh, so I have been using Python and Jupyter for several years now. Um, I switched from uh, using MATLAB mainly to Python uh, for, uh, for a research project uh, that was doing microscopy and microbiology. And so I did all my research uh, with these tools. I published papers also using these tools. And uh, now currently I still use those tools in my, uh, in my position as bioimage analyst at uh, Univern, where I'm supporting the local uh, research community. Um, I'm writing software for them, and so I use these tools for uh, medium to large scale uh, uh, projects. Um, we also use uh, Jupyter a lot in our science IT support unit to give courses. So we give regular courses on, on Python for data science, uh, image processing, and so we use systematically Jupyter and made only really good experiences with, uh, with these tools. Of course, they are not appropriate for everything. Then there is a question of taste. So I hope I can show you how to use them and so that you, you will be able to uh, decide where you think it's a, a good tool for, uh, for yourself. It's a good tool for both beginners and advanced people. So I was saying we use these for really uh, beginners uh, in courses and uh, the, it gives a very um, close feeling to, to the code. So you will see that you have a very, uh, very good um, um, control over the code. Okay, so we see now the poll. So many people have already used Python. That's a good thing. Um, and it's also used by more advanced uh, programmers. So if you write an entire analysis pipeline, it's a very popular software also, especially for people doing data science. It came actually mainly from there because it's a tool that gives you a, a way to really look at your data. So it's, it's used a lot in data intensive uh, uh, domains, typically imaging. Uh, as well. Uh, I have to say that I'm not a developer of those tools, right? I'm a, I'm a heavy user of those tools. So this presentation is going to be a bit different from some of the previous ones where you had the, the, the actual developers of the, of the software presenting. So this is more a, a user perspective that I will give you today. And so what is the, the goal? So there is uh, what I, here I called um, uh, the Python activation uh, ba uh, barrier. So you usually start somewhere, um, somewhere here. Uh, you say, oh, you see maybe a, a very cool Python tool that you would like to use. And uh, you try to see how to install those things. And the goal, the end goal would be to reach this point where you uh, happily uh, uh, use Python ever after, okay? But very often what happens is that people get stuck somewhere in the middle and they are really busy with Python but not doing what they actually want. They are busy doing things like uh, installations and uh, they're wondering how to install uh, Jupyter, how um, do I make sure that I have a right Python version, how do I install the package, and so a lot of people then at some point give up um, because there is this kind of activation barrier that uh, I see quite often. So the goal in this course for us is really to somehow lower this barrier uh, so that you will be able to explore these tools very easily. So you will see that we set up the entire course so that you can um, uh, go through all the, the course material uh, on your own without having to install anything on your own computer. So you will be able to work remotely and to use uh, the, these tools um, uh, without having to install anything. Um, a few words about the, the course content. So this is not a course 
uh, on the theory of uh, uh, image processing. Uh, it's really designed for people who have already knowledge in image processing, but not in Python and who want to know how they could uh, do image processing in Python. So it's not an exhaustive course. Um, also, the topics I am covering in, in the material that you will explore yourself, I selected topics that I use or that I think are of, of general interest, but there are many, many others that I'm not talking about. So you have to imagine this course a bit more like a, like a tasting menu in a fancy restaurant. You get 12 dishes, you discover something that you like, uh, where you get only one bite, and then you decide, oh, I'm going to cook that for myself at home. And then you will have really to explore this uh, by, by, by yourself. So it's in no means, so you, there are a lot of topics and they're covered uh, quite on the surface, right? So don't expect to learn everything about image processing Python during this course. And um, we may also spend quite a lot of time on like the technical aspect of, of using uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, because it's a, an interface that is quite unusual compared to other uh, graphical interfaces when you ha have uh, regular applications. And so it works slightly differently. And I want to make sure that everybody understands uh, how it is working and why it's working the way it works. So we'll spend a lot of time on this and a bit of time on the actual image processing. But the actual image processing part, you will do mostly with the self-learning uh, material. So the course is organized uh, like this. Um, I will introduce today the Jupyter Notebooks, the Python tools for bioimage analysis that uh, we will use. I will introduce you to the self-learning material. So I will tell you where you can find it, how you can run it uh, in this first webinar. And of course, as explained, there is this Q&A. And um, I'm happy to have uh, these three people who are doing, doing the moderation. Uh, so there are two colleagues, actually, Michaelo and Cedric, who also work at the Bern. They are both have background in the more engineering physics and uh, now work both on image processing in, in biology for live, live microscopy, and uh, Dominic Kutra, who you already have seen uh, in a previous talk, I think, on, uh, on iLastic. Um, he's one of the core developers of iLastic, uh, which is written in Python, so he's very well placed to answer uh, your questions. So then you will have one week to go through the self-learning material. Again, no download, no installation required. And uh, in the second webinar, we will answer questions uh, that appeared very often. And I will also go through uh, some of the more advanced notebooks. So the content will depend a bit on, on how many questions you, ha you have and how far people are going. So we will do a, a second poll at the end of this, uh, of this uh, seminar to know if people plan to really uh, go through the, through the content. So the course material is available on GitHub. I will talk about uh, GitHub and what it is uh, later, but you can use this link. You will find all the, all the notebooks there. Um, and this presentation is also available. You can look at it. And so you will have all the links that I'm going to click around in, uh, in this presentation. You, you can have access to it also, also here. So what is the, the Python uh, ecosystem uh, the, for bioimage analysis? So of course, the first part is uh, Python. So Python is uh, a language, uh, it gives you a syntax, um, and it's also a software that executes the code. So if you write Python, uh, Python code, then you can use Python, uh, the Python software to execute the, co the code that, that you wrote. It's used in a lot, a lot of domains, uh, very different ones. Python has already a lot of uh, functions and packages that you can use. Uh, out of the box, um, but they are uh, used in, in, in many other domains. So we are not going to rely on very advanced features of Python. So if you have no idea about Python, you can just look at a, a very basic course. There are links in the, in the course material to some uh, online courses also that you can follow to have a, 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 an idea. There is also one notebook about really the, the essential Python that you should know uh, to be able to go through the course. So we will mainly re rely on additional packages. So if you're familiar with Fiji, it's a bit like um, um, uh, it's a bit like uh, having the modules uh, in Fiji. Uh, and there's uh, additional components, and so the main components we are going to use are uh, NumPy to handle images as matrices, Scikit-Image uh, for all the image processing uh, software. So Scikit-Image is a very important part of this course, and um, it covers like 90% of all the functions we are going to use. 
And then there is matplotlib to do plotting of the images. Uh, it's a very extensive library for plotting and we are going to use a, like a very tiny, tiny part of it. So we'll not dive too much into, into the details. And then there are additional packages for speci specific applications, uh, visualizations, image import, uh, tracking, uh, segmentation, and they are uh, uh, demonstrated uh, in some of the, of the notebooks. Then we need an interface uh, for all this software, and this is going to be Jupyter. So we're going to spend quite a lot of time understanding what Jupyter is. And we need an infra infrastructure to run all this and to install all this. So we are going to, you to see two services, Binder and Google Colab, which provide a way to uh, run notebooks. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention uh, how to ins you can install packages in Python, uh, but it's going to be very brief because the point is that you can do this course without installing anything. So if you, I, I only give a few hints if you really want to install this on your machine in the future on how you should, uh, how you should proceed. And I will also mention, of course, GitHub, which uh, hosts all the, all the data of this course. So the first part is Jupyter Notebooks. So I will present uh, Jupyter Notebooks and then we'll uh, quite extensively, then we'll probably do a break with a few questions and then I will go by, to the more uh, bio-image processing part. But again, the bio-image processing part is going to be heavier in the, in the next uh, webinar. Uh, so how does classic software work uh, compared to Notebooks? So in classic software, so this is of course a simplification uh, for all uh, professional software developers, but for the point of showing the difference, I, I just simplified it. So you write some um, um, uh, code uh, in, in a file, then you open a, um, a terminal, a command line window, and you execute your code. So you type something like Python and the name of your function. This runs the entire um, routine that you have. Um, this results in a, in a folder that contains your results. And your results can be different things. It can be images, segmentation, it can be actual plots that you generate. Uh, it can be results like a CSV file, and sometimes you re-import this CSV file in another software, like you would do, for example, in Fiji. Um, this is the, the, the classical way. And of course, you see that there is a kind of a distance between the software that you write and the end result. Okay, so if you want to uh, improve a pipeline, it's going to be a bit tedious to use the, this approach. And this is why and notebooks are so popular in, the, in data science and also in image processing, is they, they kind of mix all these things to, together. And so you see here, I made a, a short video on how, how this works. So here you see a, um, a, a notebook. So the notebook is actually this kind of page, this white page on a gray background. You see that it runs in the, in the browser. We're going to see a bit more about this um, in a moment. And you see that we mix different components, right? So um, you have code, like in these gray cells, you have text where you can comment things uh, about your code, and then you have a rich output. So you can have images, uh, you can have plots and graphs. So you can really have your entire analysis pipeline in one plot. And you see here that I here I'm going to change one of the variables. So this is just a very basic thresholding of an image. You can change this parameter, and re-execute your code live, see the results of your thresholding, and uh, remake a, a new histogram. And so this is the way you can use um, uh, Jupyter to uh, really explore your data. So it's really a very nice tool to explore data dynamically. Um, so, what is a Jupyter notebook? In the end, it's just a text file. So if you, you can open any of these notebooks uh, in your text editor and you will see that you have the content of these cells plus some formatting uh, so that you, you know that this is a cell, this is the second cell, etc. And so what Jupyter is doing is just rendering the, the content of this notebook uh, in your browser. And so there are different ways to do this rendering. Jupyter is one, there are other solutions, but today we focus on, on Jupyter. Uh, but remember that it's just a text file. So if you have a notebook, <clears throat> you can essentially just send it by email to some, some, someone else and that person will be able to open it uh, via, via Jupyter. Uh, as I was saying, there are um, uh, different types of cells and the, the content is split into, into these cells. So 
Each of these parts is ex executed uh, separately and there are different types. And I was mentioning, you can have code and these are these grayed out cells. You can have text, formatted text, and you can have rich output. Okay, so you can have different types of content. So now I will just switch for a moment to, um, to an actually live uh, demo of how this works to illustrate a bit how this notebook work. Um, so I just need to get back to this. So this is a, a, a notebook, how it would appear uh, in your browser. Uh, this is one is running on my own computer. Uh, we will run these things remotely and you will see that it looks exactly uh, in the say, same way, uh, whether it's running on your, on your computer or, or, or remotely. So I mean, this cell here, I can start typing code. I will make it a bit bigger maybe so that everybody can see it well. Uh, I can write variables and okay so I defined a few variables and then combine them and then you see the output so whenever you just have one variable and and execute the cell you see the content of that uh, of that variable you see that the variables you define they are defined for the whole notebook right it's not just per cell so whatever you write in 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 a, in, in, a, in a cell is shared across uh, across a notebook. Um, be attentive to the fact that the execution doesn't depend on the order of the, of the cell, so the top down, right? So if I, I can redefine here A and give it another value and you see that this changes the value of C, okay? Uh, so I really encourage you to have a top down approach so that your code should really run from the first cell to the last cell and avoid these kind of loops because this makes it really difficult to understand what code is doing if you have to jump across your notebook okay so really try uh, to avoid uh, doing that um, so you saw that just to to create those cells to write in those cells you just click in that cell and then you can edit it so you can do that in any cell whenever you execute a cell it cr automatically creates a new cell where you can write if you want to add cells uh, in between these two, you can use uh, the menu. You can say insert, insert cell above or below, but you're going to do that a lot, a lot, a lot. So you want to use some shortcuts that exist in, uh, in, in Jupyter. So if I am currently in this cell, there is a shortcut uh, that says that if I type A for above, it will add a cell above this cell. Uh, but of course, if I type here, this just types inside my cell. So I first have to get out of the cell. To do that, you have to type escape. Okay, so if I type escape, and you see that this uh, cell turns blue. So it's green if I'm editing, escape, it turns blue. This means that I can do operations on the, on the whole cell in that case. Okay, so if now I type A, this creates a cell above. You can do the same, now type B, now I have a cell below. So A, B, so there are four or five of the shortcuts that you should remember. Uh, if you want to delete a cell, you type uh, quickly twice on D. So if I want now to delete this cell, I type escape and then twice uh, D, and this suppresses the cell. Okay, and you can do that with, with all cells. Um, and what I didn't mention is when you have a cell, and this is quite important, if you want to execute the content of that cell, you can click here on run but you're going to do that a lot also. So to execute this cell, you can just type shift enter. So if you type shift enter, this executes the cell. Now you have a menu bar here, like in, in other applications. Um, uh, mostly you, will, you, you can explore it uh, uh, by yourself. So you have a file system, etc. There are a few specific to notebooks. So especially the, the cell tab here, so you can, for example, run all cells. So this will run from the top to the bottom all your cells. It's quite practical. You can run cell all the cells which are above your position or below, um, et cetera. Finally, you saw that we had uh, some text, formatted text. So this is, uh, if I write text, I'm getting an error. So you see that you have also error messages in, in Jupyter and it doesn't know what to do with this text because it doesn't correspond to any Python code. Um, so the problem here is that you should tell uh, Jupyter that this is not code, this should be um, text. And so the way you do that is you can go here, 
this tab here and you can select Markdown. So Markdown is a language to um, do basic formatting of text. And this is what is used in Python. So we're going to use only these two types and not, not, not these two. So you have the choice between code and Markdown and you can go back and forth. So now if I execute this cell, shift enter, you see that this creates formatted text. You can Google uh, about um, Markdown for details. I'll just show you a few examples. If you want to write a title, you use a hash. If you want a subtitle, write two hashes, etc. And you can format text. You can use stars. This is creating italic. And you can use double stars. This create bold. You can create lists and tables. Um, so there are lots of possibilities. But you see, it's a very simple uh, language that allows you to do 90% of what you have to do in, in terms of uh, text uh, formatting for this kind of, uh, of work. So it's, it's a very nice language that you can use in other places too. For example, GitHub, and we'll see that later. Um, now I go back to, the, to this presentation. So you have all the information here in the slides. Often there, are, there is information in the slides that I don't uh, directly show, but because I'm showing it live, but if you want to go through the slide later, you should have all the information um, available. Uh, we have also, when you open Jupyter, the first thing you meet is not um, this uh, notebook, is a sort of file browser. Okay, so this is, looks like this. So you have files here. When you actually look, will look at the, at the content of the course, you will have many more files. So you have folders and you can just browse through your folder. Click here to go one level up and you can open any of these notebooks by clicking on them. Um, you can um, select a notebook and do some operation on it. We'll see that later. So, and you can also move, this is your folder structure. You can also move in the folder structure by clicking on here. If I want to go one level up. If I have a notebook which is not yet active, I get options to duplicate, rename, etc., or to, or to trash a notebook. This is all pretty standard. And there are just two more options. You can upload data. This will be more relevant in a moment when, when you see that it, this all can run uh, uh, online. And you can create new notebooks. So here you can create a new Python 3 notebook, for example. You won't get all these options. Uh, or you can create a text file, a folder, or open a terminal. But we don't look at terminal today. Okay, so this is a, just a basic browser. This reproduces your, the content of your regular uh, browser, right? So it's just integrated inside this notebook system. And finally, here in, you have many multiple tabs. The only important one today is to know that you can see which notebooks are running. Okay, and so this brings us to the next uh, point, which is how do these notebooks actually uh, run? So the notebook is displayed in the browser, um, as you have seen, but the browser is not doing any calculation except rendering your content. So it can be a bit heavy calculations if you do 3D rendering, but if you do a Gaussian filtering of an image, the filtering is not done by the browser, right? So it's done by what is called a kernel, and we use a Python kernel. You can use Jupyter with other languages. We just focus on Python today. And so what this says is that to each browser you have attached like a Python instance, and this is doing the calculation for you. Okay, so it's just uh, named uh, a kernel in, in this context. Um, so the browser sends computations to your kernel, the kernel does a computation, and uh, if you want to plot an image, for example, the browser tells the kernel, okay, I need that image, can you, can you send it to me? And then you can display the image, okay? But the whole calculation is done here. And the interesting thing is that Thanks to this, it really doesn't matter where your kernel is running, right? So um, um, you can run the kernel on different places. So you can run it on your own laptop. You can run it in the cloud. You can run it on the server. So if your university has a cluster, for example, it really doesn't matter for you. The only thing that you will see is the interface in the browser. And this one will be identical whatever, uh, uh, wherever the, the, the kernel is running. Okay, so this, this is, I think, a very attractive feature of, of Jupyter Notebooks is that if you have access to uh, important re calculation resources, typically a cluster, and uh, you can discuss with your IT people to install uh, um, a Jupyter on these resources, then you don't have to care about this, but you have access to uh, high computing resources from an interface you are familiar with. So you don't have to learn again 
how to access the resources. So I think this is really an important feature. Um, so the notebook, ker notebook kernel I was saying is attached to your notebook. So we see that uh, we have here a running notebook. As I was saying, uh, it's shown green here. This means that it's active. So active means that all the variables that are defined here are in memory and I can access to them all the time. Okay, so whenever now my, my kernel is shutting down, either because I shut it down or because it shut down, uh, those variables are lost. So the content of my notebook is not lost. This is there. This is just text. Um, but the variables are not defined anymore. Okay. So um, if, and so the kernel can be restarted uh, in different ways. So you can say here, interrupt or restart. Interrupt will just interrupt a, 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 an ongoing calculation. Should be used, for example, if uh, you have a bug and an infinite loop and uh, calculation is not stopping, you can try to interrupt. It doesn't work all the time. Sometimes you have to restart the whole kernel. So you have these options. Um, so you can just click on those. I will just show you another option. So you can also stop the kernel directly here. So if you go here and you say shut down, the notebook turns gray and um, the variables are lost. So now if I go back here, and if I ask what is A, it's, it's thinking for some reason. Let me just reload this. Okay, now it's gone. Okay, it tells me that there is an error. Uh, it tells me A is not defined. Okay, so I shut down the kernel. All the variables which were in memory are not there anymore, but the content of my notebook is still there. So this is quite a, an important aspect. Note that you can have multiple notebooks running, uh, but each of them is going to have uh, variables in memory. If you work with images, that's going to be a lot of memory. So you should be careful about not having uh, 20 notebooks running at the same time, because at some point uh, the system will crash. Okay, so it's a good policy to, from time to time, stop the notebook. One point more, so let me just define here D and save my notebook. You can just save it uh, with usual uh, uh, controls. You can also change the name here if you want. Um, I don't have to keep this tab open. You see notebooks open in these tabs. I can close my tab, but my notebook is still active. Okay. If I reopen it and I ask what is D, D is still defined. Okay. So these things remain in memory. So to shut it down, I really have to say restart or uh, shut it down from here. Okay, so this is how this kernel works, and it works everywhere in the in the same way. Um, yeah, so it's a good practice to periodically restart your kernel and run the whole notebook because then you will avoid having these typical issues of having a, a variable uh, that is defined uh, not in the right and not in the top-down order. The other thing that might happen is that you define a variable and then at some point you decide, oh, I don't need it anymore. So you suppress this line here and you think it still works. It still works because you defined it previously, but as soon as you stop your kernel, right, this doesn't work anymore because A is not defined. Uh, and so this happens quite a lot when you are uh, developing code because you are changing names of variables. And so it's a good policy to sometimes restart the kernel and just run everything to be sure that you didn't lose uh, any variable by cleaning up the code, for example. Okay, um, so now this was abstract. You couldn't see exactly, uh, you couldn't do it yourself. Now I will show you how in principle you can access to these notebooks um, yourselves. So the whole content of the course, I was, as I was saying, is available on GitHub. Um, so GitHub is a repository for code. Uh, it's based on Git. Uh, so if you are familiar with uh, data repositories for images, for example, uh, Zenodo or Figshare or things like this, it's similar, but for code. Okay, so it's very de it's designed uh, for code. So all programmers are putting code there, big companies, uh, all the packages that I'm going to talk about today, they are almost all on, on GitHub. Uh, so you can have many versions of code. You can follow the history of code. There are many, many tools for developers um, uh, to do uh, lots of operations that I will not describe here. So we use it more like a, like a, like a repository, a place to store uh, files. And you can go to this link 
this will open a window and your browser this you can visit this repository there is some description of how the repository should be used so whenever you think you want to run this you can hear and and and, and read a bit about it uh, you see that there are different files here there you have also folders so you can really browse through this content a code file so a dot py file will be shown like this so you will have some syntax highlighting and a notebook uh, can be rendered so usually github renders notebooks but sometimes it fails so this works so you see that it renders it uh, pretty much the same way as in in the regular uh, um, active uh, browser that we had before uh, and you can read the, all the, these documents um, as as a as a book essentially okay so all my all the notebooks i created for this course are have lots of comments so everything which is done is commented so in principle should be able to follow all these course uh, you see however that this is not interactive so i cannot click in cells i cannot execute cells uh, so this is uh, a limitation and we are going to see tools to go beyond this afterwards if this if the notebooks don't render properly because it happens sometimes on github you can use another service uh, which is called uh, MD Viewer. So you just copy the address of uh, this repository and then you go to this service called MD Viewer. Everything is explained also in the slides and in the repository. And here you can just copy paste the address of this GitHub repository, type enter, and this will give you a nice rendered view of the content. Okay. So for example, I made an index of all the content of this course. And you can uh, you can browse through it. You can click on these links, and it opens these notebooks, and uh, which are nicely nicely rendered. Um, again, still this is not interactive. Okay, so this is a limitation. Uh, this is just HTML. So it's nice, for example, if you have your own pipeline and you want somehow to publish it, to share it with people, so they can see what what, what you did. You can really use these notebooks as as documents to share. Okay, and this is another really, I think, nice feature of, of notebooks. Um, so this was about sharing notebooks uh, and the viewer. So you, you see they have all the links. You can even create these links if you want to send them to people. Uh, but now we want to make things interactive. So how are we going to do that? Um, so remember that I was saying you have these two independent things. Your notebook is running in the browser, but the calculation is done by a kernel, which can be somewhere else. And there are services that allow you to exploit this. So we are going to see two of those. One is Binder. It's an open source project um, uh, supported by a few uh, foundations that pay for uh, computational resources. And they're also supported by uh, universities. And so they provide computational resources so that you can run things interactively without login, without to pay anything. Uh, it's really for free. There are, of course, limitations in terms of computational resources, uh, and data storage, um, but it's really a great feature if you want just to explore the data. The other one is Google Colab. So it's Google Colab is a, like a clone of Jupyter developed by Google. And you can also run notebooks there on Google infrastructure. And we'll see uh, this a bit later. So what is this binder service? Um, uh, it's a web page that can connect to it with, to a web page, um, and uh, it explains you what it does. It turns a Git repo, like a, this GitHub repository that we have here, into a collection of interactive uh, notebooks. Okay, interactive meaning that you will have the same window we have here will be started remotely for you uh, without you having to do anything. So there is a, a whole technology stack behind this that I'm not going to talk about. You can read uh, in the docs if you are interested to know how this works, uh, and it's uh, uh, really quite impressive, uh, quite impressive uh, software that uh, is really nice to use for, for this kind of demos. Or if you publish a paper, for example, and you want people to be able to run your code, you can put it on GitHub and people can run it through that service and really run it interactively without having to care about what resources you use. So I'm going to just make a short example. So the, um, the service, uh, runs at different speed depending on how complicated your repository is. So I made just an empty repository here just to illustrate how, how, how this works. 
uh, for you so that you, we don't have to wait too much time. So I will just copy here this thing. You have some additional options. You can open specific notebooks, etc. Then we hit launch. So notice that there is no login. You don't have, you don't need a, an account or anything. It's free for everyone. I already built it. So it has to build the environment and then launch it. So this is really fast in that case. Um, because it's such a simple repository and you see that it opens for me this new web page in my browser that is a Jupyter session that is uh, identical to what I had before. So we have again this, uh, this browser uh, and we can do interactive computation. So we can create a new notebook. It opens a notebook. I can type Okay, so it's really interactive, so you can really run code. And here I created a notebook, but in the case of the course, you will have access to the notebooks already made. So you can run them, modify them uh, as, uh, as you wish. Um, so it's really a great way to give people access to these, to these resources. The drawback is of course that this is not permanent. So this session will, will stop. If you stop using it for 10 minutes, uh, it will shut down. And so all your work will be lost. Uh, if you still want to keep work that you did, uh, there are two ways of doing that. Uh, you can first save your notebook, uh, give it a name, my notebook. Um, and then uh, you can download it. Okay, so this will download it to your computer and then uh, you can reopen it if you want. So this is my notebook. I can put it back here and I can uh, go here, it should be in here. So you see that there is my notebook here. So this now runs on my own computer and you can uh, reuse whatever you did, okay? So this is the first uh, possibility, uh, just to um, uh, download it. There are, there is, there are new options uh, f uh, since not that long where you can store your notebook in the, in the browser. So this works only if you use notebooks which are pre-made and that you modify. So imagine you open a notebook and you modify it, then you can use this button that says save to browser storage. It will save it. Now your session, session stops, uh, you have to restart it. When you restart, the, the original notebooks come back, so without your modifications. And then you can use the other button which is Restore, uh, restore from browser storage, and this will uh, recover your changes, okay? So these are the options you have to keep your work. This is not designed to, for, for, for heavy users. So if you decide, okay, I'm going to use Python for, to develop uh, pipelines, uh, you should not use this service, right? You should then definitely install the entire system on your own computer, because this is, will be too complicated with the sessions that time out to, um, to handle this. But it's really a great, uh, great resource. Um, so I will, I will see now if I, I can show you how to run the, um, the course itself. Uh, so let's go back to this repository. This is the course repository. How do you start it? You start it by clicking here. There is a button that says launch binder. So you don't even have to copy the GitHub address here. You can just click on this button. Uh, just as a, as a note right now, don't click all the, at the same time right now. Maybe wait until also after the course or wait until you can also use Colab uh, because this service is open for everyone. There are limitations. Um, um, uh, so just wait a bit or if you start it and uh, you see that uh, nothing happened or you have to wait a long time, just try later. It just means that too many people are just trying it out. So we have again this window that opens, you get some information. It says that it's found already a built image. It's launching my server. And this step uh, can take a bit longer, um, depending on how many people are using the system at the moment, okay? So I will, ah, okay, so it's starting up and we have all the material here. So the material is in this folder called BiAPI and you have all the notebooks. And if I open one notebook, I can execute it. So shift enter. So this imports a package, imports other package. 
you see that here we import an image. I will say a word about this later and we can display that image, okay? And this image is already stored on this service. So there is a folder, and if I go up here, and it's called data, that contains all the images. So this is um, ready to use. So the data are uploaded there, the notebooks are uploaded there. You can just use them. Um, so this is uh, the no installation, no download uh, solution, it, which is, I think, the preferred solution. It's the easiest one, uh, easiest one to use. Uh, if you want to test, so if you see that in notebook, oh, this is interesting, I want to test it on my own image. Now you can use the upload button, right? So you can pick an image from your browser and uh, upload it and then process that image um, as a test. Uh, so everything will be available there. Now, if I close this and I close my session, uh, the, the this session is, is gone, okay? So everything is lost. Uh, I would have to save and download the notebook as I was showing before, okay? So this is a, an absolutely a great tool to use. Um, special thanks to the MindBinder uh, team. Uh, I told them I would organize this and that uh, many people might uh, try this system out. And since they have limits on the system, they agree to increase the, the, the limits uh, for, for this course. So a big thanks to, to, to them. Um, yeah, so this is how it looks when your binder session stops. Okay, so the connection failed and then you have to restart. Um, so you have all the information in the slide. So the other solution is Google Collab. Uh, Google Collab um, is um, an alternative. So it's Google version of uh, Jupyter. You see that they changed a bit the, the layout, how things look, but the principles are exactly the same. So code is separated in, uh, the notebook is separated in the, into the cells. You can have code, you can have text, formatted text. It works exactly um, uh, like uh, Jupyter notebooks. Just they named a few things uh, slightly differently. Yeah, they all run on Google infrastructure. So Google has uh, servers where, where this is running. Um, and you can use Collab to create notebooks, to upload notebooks, and you can also uh, run any notebook which is on GitHub or any other Git service. Uh, you can run them directly uh, on, on, on Google Collab. Uh, so it works a bit the same as uh, before. So let's go back to our uh, repository. And this was the, this is the course repository. Now you can click on open in collab. And this will bring you to this page. It asks you to log in on, uh, on GitHub, but you don't have to. So uh, there, this is a mistake. I don't know if it's because of me or of their system. You just uh, close this window and uh, then you're, you, you should see a window that looks like this. You see that this links to the repository, a specific branch. So there is, for people who are familiar with GitHub, there is a specific branch uh, for Collab and uh, you can open a notebook and it looks like this, okay? So this is text again, so you can double click and edit. Um, and these are code cells. So you can, it, tell, it just warns you that the, to be sure that you really want to run it. And so this imports NumPy, for example. So it works a bit the same way. You can add code or text uh, um, cells using these buttons. There are also shortcuts that are a bit, are a bit awkward. Uh, you have information here about how much RAM and disk you're using. So this runs on their infrastructure. They uh, guarantee you uh, some limited amount of uh, computation. Um, the sessions also have a limit. So that it's maximally 12 hours of uh, session. So it's much longer than binder, uh, but it's not guaranteed to be, to be uh, 12 hours. Um, you see that what it was called before kernel is called the runtime. So you can interrupt the execution. You can restart your runtime. This works the same way as in, uh, in, in classic uh, Jupyter uh, um, service. And there are other options that you can explore uh, on your own. One really important aspect of Google Collab is that you can choose the runtime type. So if I click here, 
this opens this window and I can say if I want to use a GPU or TPU. So in graphic processing units or this is the specific Google version of GPUs, TPUs. So you can really use GPUs from Google uh, with these notebooks. So this is one of the main reasons this has become such a popular uh, resource, these collab notebooks, because people doing machine learning often need uh, GPUs and so they get for free essentially a GPU uh, via this way. So this is one of the main aspects of uh, using Google Collab. Um, there are two differences uh, still with um, uh, the regular notebooks uh, with, a, with the binder solution is uh, some of the, um, some of the, I'll just show you some of the notebooks uh, need additional packages installed. So there are lots of things already installed uh, or directly on Collab that you don't have to take care of yourself, but some specific ones are not. So here I have a notebook where I'm just uh, very quickly looking how to use the Stardist and Cellpose, which are machine learning based. And you see that here you have to install them. So you have at the top of no the notebooks, you have all the time a cell that looks like this that you have to execute and it will install things for you. So you don't have to do it yourself, just execute that cell. That cell. The other thing that you have to take care of is uh, how you access the data. Uh, so you should use Google Drive to do that. Uh, so you should download the, the data from, uh, from Google Drive. And then when you execute this cell, you will be able to connect to Google Drive. So the data, they are, if we go back to the description, I explain where you can get the data here. They're on a Zenodo repository. So this is a data repository. So I made it for this course and you can download. So this is a data.zip file. So download it on your computer, then upload it to your Google Drive and put it at the very top uh, level of your, of your Google Drive. Okay, so if I open uh, Google Drive here, there is this da data folder that contains all the data. So I already did, did that, so it's already there. So you have this first step to do before you can access uh, the data. Once you have done that, you execute this cell, which is always at the top of the notebook. And you will see that it will wants to make sure it needs access to your Google Drive, so it wants to make sure that it's you. So it gives you a link. This brings you to a, a sign-in page from Google. You select the account you want to use. Then you have to agree to share data with it. So maybe create a special account for this. And then you have to copy this address, this code, and you have to put it here. So there is a line here, type enter, and now you will be connected to your Google Drive. Okay, so this is how uh, notebooks work in, in Google Collab. So there are a lot of resources also from Collab to explain you how all this is working in case something was not, uh, uh, not very clear. You see that it's a bit more complicated than using Binder, but you get longer sessions and GPUs. So depending on your needs, you might want to use uh, different solutions. Um, so finally, you saw that we had to install um, uh, in here, we had to install some packages. We use this co co command called pip. So there are two, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but so there are two main ways of installing packages. One of them is pit, with, uh, pip with this uh, Python package index. The other one is conda. So with pip, you use these commands uh, that are always called pip installed something. So you can look up if you are, want to install a package like scikit image. You can Google it and type pip uh, scikit image and it will bring you to that uh, package in index repository and this tells you how to install it. So you can run this command either from your uh, command line, uh, just like this, or directly from a notebook, okay? So in a notebook, you will have to type uh, this exclamation point and whatever you want to install. So you, here I made an example. This package is not available. It tells me no module named uh, skimage, which would be scikit image. So now I'm saying, okay, pip install uh, scikit image, and it will install it uh, in, uh, for, 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 uh, for this notebook and on, in general on your computer. You can install multiple packages. You can install specific versions. The other solution is Conda. And uh, I think this is my preferred way of doing this because Conda has more features than PIP. 
uh, you can install, you can again Google it and look for the command that you have to type in your command line to install the package. Um, it does a few things more. So if you install several packages that depend on different packages, so for example, scikit image depends on NumPy, and you might want to install another package that de depends on another version of NumPy, Conda is going to look for the best combination of, of versions for, for you. So this is one of the main aspects of, of using Conda to do that. And it's not limited to Python software. So if you need to install FFmpeg or CUDA libraries, you can do it through CUDA, which makes your life much easier. And you can create isolated environments. So if you, install, if you start installing things on your computer just with pip without caring about any environment, you will quickly create a mess um, of versions and you have, have, will have conflicts of versions. Uh, so this is going to be difficult to handle. So the ver way of doing that is to create separate environments, so like virtual environments on your computer, where you can install uh, a specific version or a, a series of, of packages that you, that you need. Okay, it, it sounds very complicated, but it's really done in one command. You can say conda create uh, environment and then activate it. This is also explained in a notebook if you want, in, in the repository, if you want to do a local install. Um, and it will really make your life easier. So if you want, want to install this on your computer, really go for, for Conda, uh, it's, it's the best solution. Again, there are more detailed instructions in the repository. An alternative is to use a, a, um, a graphical interface. So there is a thing called Anaconda Navigator, and this allows you to do all the things I just said uh, using this interface. So you can create environments, you can install packages, you can even start um, Jupyter from here, you see here and other software. So this is a, a great way of installing all the things you need and handle these environments. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on this since for this course, you can run everything without caring uh, at all about this. But if you want to do a local install, go for Conda uh, or Anaconda. Okay, so the next part is about uh, the, the libraries we're going to use. Uh, but so we are probably going to take uh, a few questions if there are a few questions, and then we are going to spend the last half an hour, uh, 20 minutes, we will see how far we come. What is not covered today will be covered uh, next time. At least now you know how to access all the notebooks, how to run them via Binder or Collab. Uh, if something was too fast or unclear, you can just go again through the slides. You can ask uh, your questions. Um, and we will probably have a way for you to ask questions during the week, so that if you are entirely lost, um, We'll answer these questions uh, at the next session. So, yeah. yes. Yeah, so we have uh, a couple of questions here which we would forward to you. Yeah. So, one is Is Jupyter better than Spider? What are the main differences? Okay, so I'm not a Spider user. Uh, I know that uh, several people use it. Even in the courses I give, uh, sometimes people come and use Spider instead of Jupyter but I'm absolutely not an expert, uh, so I really couldn't tell you. So what I can say is a lot of these things are really a matter of taste. So people will have big battles on what is the best way to, best tools to, to write software or even to do image processing. But a lot of it is in the end, question of taste. But I don't know much more about Spider. But you have seen that it's, for example, available in, uh, in Anaconda. So if you install Anaconda, you will have Spider <coughs> available. Well, if I may comment quickly on that, yeah. I would say that the main advantage of uh, Jupyter Notebooks is that you have your uh, data and descriptions directly there and it's stored there. So if you generate plots, you can just save it all together and you will have some sort of um, report basically directly in your notebook, while to best of my knowledge in uh, Spider, you cannot do that. Yeah, I think that's one of the great advantages of Jupyter that I showed uh, also at the beginning that you have. You go from image imports to final plots that you can put in a publication in, in a single notebook. So, yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, can Jupyter show the list of variables and functions defined by the user like either other IDE do like MATLAB or Spider? Uh, yeah, so you can, I don't think you can do it uh, with the regular, um, uh, with the basic um, uh, Jupyter, but what I didn't mention for the sake of speed and not to confuse people at all, 
is that there are extensions uh, to notebooks. Uh, so you should Google it if you want to use these extensions. So you, one that you might have seen here is that you can create a table of contents. So this is an extension, for example, to Jupyter Notebooks. And there are several of them. And I know that some of them allow you to have like a list of variables that you're currently using. What I'm also not uh, showing here that there is another version of, uh, of these notebooks called Jupyter Lab, and it's accessible if you install Anaconda, which is uh, something closer to, to MATLAB, for example, where you have also extensions. And I think there you definitely have extensions to, to show variables. So if you want to look at any extensions, you will have to, to look that up uh, yourself. So it's too short to, to cover all this. <laughs> Okay, uh, another very interesting question is if I want users, biologists with basic programming experience actively use such notebooks, what is the best way to do that in your experience? So in my experience, um, you should, have, if in, in as far as possible, avoid um, the, the installation step. So in 99% in of the cases, everything uh, works well. Uh, but it also works well because um, people who are programming, probably like most of the audience here, um, they know what the command line is and they, they can deal with the different little issues that can occur. But in most of the cases, it's not a problem. But people who have a very um, uh, basic experience of programming or no experience, they will struggle with these things. So the best, in my opinion, is to create a remote uh, resource. Um, as I was saying, you can, for example, ask your IT department. So if you have, a, for example, a cluster running at the university, you can ask them to install Jupyter there and to have a bit, um, something slightly similar to this binder service, uh, but where it's permanent. So people can log in, uh, use their usual credentials and work there. And their, their work is running uh, remotely, but uh, displayed in the browser. And so. Uh, this is called a uh, Jupyter Hub. There are different versions of these Jupyter Hubs, but it's possible to install this. Or you can do it yourself. So I'm doing it at our university. I set up one of these Jupyter Hubs using a, um, it's called Switch in Switzerland. So it's a quite kind of equivalent to Amazon or uh, Google services for, uh, for remote computing. So you can set up one of these Jupyter Hubs and then give people um, just access to that. Uh, and so they can just connect to it uh, via the browser and don't have to care uh, about installing anything. So I think that's the best solution. Otherwise, you can just, if you have a very close collaboration, you can just help people install this on their own uh, computer. And once it's set up, it works uh, not forever, but for a very long time. Okay, there is a... Another question that I'm not familiar with, can you use Binder to make versioning of a pipeline directly back to GitHub? Um, this, I don't uh, think so, but I'm not entirely sure. I don't think you can push things back to, uh, to, uh, to GitHub. You can do this definitely, um, again, with some ex extensions in Jupyter. So you can handle uh, Git, uh, directly from from Jupyter, you can push and pull and do these kind of things with extensions. But I don't think that you can do that in Binder directly. All right, probably for now we are fine. Okay, very good. Then I will cover uh, the next uh, part, which is really more about bio image uh, processing. Uh, you were reporting all the questions, I, I guess. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So, and this will focus more on the package we are going on packages we are going to use. So one of the main packages is uh, NumPy. So NumPy allows us to handle uh, images. So this is uh, an image made out of pixels. Each pixel has a value that you see here in red, and you can just imagine that this is uh, a matrix, right? So uh, an image is just a big matrix of numbers, and you can do operations on these on these uh, matrix, even forgetting that uh, you, you're dealing with an actual image. And so there is no proper or simple way of handling matrices. This is a 2D image, but you can handle higher dimensional objects. There is no simple way of doing that in basic Python. And so this is why uh, people have developed NumPy. 
which allows you to handle these arrays. So they're called NumPy arrays. This is a 2D array. It has two axes. They're called axes, uh, columns, and rows um, in this case. Um, and it's very similar, if you're familiar with MATLAB, it's very similar to, to MATLAB. So MATLAB has, be, has been the pioneer, I think, in, in creating this environment where your calculations are at the matrix level. And so NumPy somehow re-implemented this. So if you know MATLAB, for example, you will not be too lost uh, in, this, in this world. So of course, you don't have only to, do, to deal with uh, 2D images. You can have higher dimensional objects. Um, so this is one plane, for example, and you can have multiple planes. So you have a third axis in that case, which would be a stack, for example, a Z stack, microscopy Z stack, and you have multiple planes, okay? And so this would be a three-dimensional array. Your ar arrays can be n-dimensional, okay? That I think there is somewhere a limit, but uh, that we never reach uh, in, in, uh, in microscopy. So you can have time, channels, Z stacks, you can have uh, like 5D arrays. And the really interesting thing is that the operations you do on, uh, on these NumPy arrays, they don't depend on how many dimensions you have. So if you want to add uh, two uh, arrays together, you don't have to care about how many dimensions they have. If you want to do an, an operation on them, you don't have to care about that. So it really simplifies a lot of the work. So there are many languages, like more basic languages, where you have to write loops, for loops, to go through all the pixels to do operations. So this is hidden away uh, when you when you use NumPy, so and NumPy is used in almost any scientific context uh, in Python, so it's a very very important resource. So there is one notebook about NumPy. Uh, I think we should really you can skim through the uh, through the whole material. If you really intend to use Python, you should really try to go in detail through that notebook to understand uh, whatever is done in the in the other notebooks. So I'm just highlighting here three. Very important uh, thing you can do in, in with NumPy arrays and that we do all the time in, this, in all these notebooks. So just that you have a bit of an idea for what is coming uh, on you. Uh, so you have an array and an important part of NumPy is doing indexing and there are other called, things called slicing. Uh, so you use basically the indexes of your array. So an array has in this case two dimensions and you can specify, okay, I want to recover this number one here. It's row number zero, column number two, and it returns you one. But you can do that in more complex cases. You can say, okay, I want to recover the line number one here. Remember that we count from zero in Python, so zero, one, two, so the line number one. And this sign here tells, okay, I want to recover all the columns. So line two and all the columns. So when I type this, it will return to me uh, this single line. Okay, so this is used a lot, a lot uh, in all these notebooks to maybe you want to crop an image. So if you crop an image, you would say from where, from which row to which row and from which column to which column you want to, want to use the indices. So these, these indices in, in, in NumPy are very, very important features. What we do a lot when we do image processing is combining arrays, right? So you can do operations. For example, you might want to mask an image. So you have an image and the binary image, and you want to somehow multiply them to mask uh, some, some parts of your image. And for that, you would do, for example, a multiplication. And I think the really important thing to understand is that this is not a standard ma matrix operation. You can do them if you want, but if you just write it like this, it's not doing a matrix operation. It's doing a pixel by pixel operation, right? So you take this first number, two, two numbers, two, two by three, six, one by one, one, and you, so you fill your entire matrix like this. So it's really a pixel by pixel operation. So this is really important to remember. And exactly if you want to do a masking of an image, this is really useful because this is what you want to do, right? You don't want to do a, a, a true matrix operation that you have learned in school. The other really important thing is that you can do operations, you can do mathematical operations on arrays, and again, this is going to operate pixel by pixel. So if I want to take the cosine uh, of this matrix, I can just say cosine of my matrix. Of course, I would just pass them the name of that uh, ar 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 array. And the output of this is a new matrix with the same dimensions. And it took the cosine of each element in this matrix. Okay, And so we do that a lot. Uh, and many, many functions in NumPy uh, in, uh, in, in, in this course will do that. So they take it as an input, a matrix, 
and they output a uh, matrix or an image of exactly the same size, having do done an operation on each, uh, on each pixel. Okay, so we will see these kind of operations uh, a lot. Uh, again, try to become familiar with NumPy. Um, uh, it will serve you not just in imaging, but uh, in the whole scientific uh, Python world. Okay, so then we want to do actual uh, image processing. And for this, we're going to use scikit-image, uh, which is a, a library that implements a lot, a lot of the classical functions that you need and even more complex ones. I just copied here uh, the, some of the text that um, you can find in the publication that describes uh, this software. It was published a few years ago. You see maybe here a few names that you see, for example, image SC forum coming up, uh, Juan Inés Iglesias or Stefan Van der Waals who are one, some of the main programmers. Uh, and the science says the project aims are one to provide high quality, well-documented and easy to use implementations of common image processing algorithms. And I put this because I have been using this now for several years and I can only say that this is uh, very, very true. So it's very easy to use. Um, they are very consistent. Uh, so you, when you know how to use one function, you will not be surprised by how you are, you're using another one that you never used. And um, it's also very well documented. So I will quickly go then through the documentation to, to, to show you how that works. So I will just show you a very few examples of the types of functions that you have available. And I only put here very simple ones. You have much more advanced functions, but for the purpose of il illustrating what is available, I'm just doing it uh, with simple functions. So first, of course, you need to import your image. So all the functions are written in that way. So you import your scikit image um, um, uh, module, and then there are submodules, a package, and then there are submodules for each uh, class of operations. So there is an IO module for import and export, and this operates like this. So you call that function, you give a file name or a path, and it returns an numpy array. And almost all functions, they take an numpy array and output an numpy array. Okay, so this, this object here now is my image is a numpy array. Now you can do a Gaussian filtering of your image. And so this is called, uh, fil so there is a specific module called filters in which you find all the filters, among them the Gaussian filter, and it takes an argument, uh, a numpy array, plus some options. So several of these functions have options. Here you can put the, the options of how wide your, your Gaussian should be. And then there are some additional, one, additional ones, for example here, I don't want to rescale my, my output. So this is exactly what you do when you do in, for example, in Fiji, when you do a Gaussian filtering, uh, Windows pop-ups and asks you uh, what sigma you want. So this is doing uh, the same thing. Okay, and the result is again, a numpy array. So numpy array in, numpy array out. Then you have lots of other modules. So you can do lots of different transformations, like rotating an image by a certain angle, you have the whole morphological uh, op operations that are available where you pass a mask, a binary image, plus the object you want to use to do the filtering. Um, if you don't know about mor morphological operations, you should have a look at the, the, one of the courses that was about MorphoLibJ, which is a great library in, in Fiji to do these kind of operations. Then you can analyze regions. You can measure uh, properties of the, of the segmented objects if you have a labeled image, for example, the area. So this is what you would do in Fiji when you do analyze particles. Uh, there are features to, uh, there is a module called features to analyze features in your image. So you can do template matching with an image and a template. Again, numpy array, numpy array. And you can do segmentation. So there are various um, packages to do segmentations, some of them really complex and uh, advanced. Uh, among them, you can do active contour. So active contour is implemented directly in scikit image and you pass uh, here an image and an initial contour, for example. So this is just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of all the things that are available in scikit image. You can follow this link to the documentation uh, called an API. And so if we go here to the filters module that I used where I picked the Gaussian, you see that you have a whole list of other filters that you can use and they all work in the same way. So the first thing you pass is an image and sometimes you need to pass a mask, but they all work in the same way. And regarding documentation, so if you go here, you click, you see that you have an extensive documentation telling you each for each of these parameters, what they are and how they should be used. 
then you have even examples and you have more complete examples. So you will never be really lost um, by trying out things and uh, having it not working. When you're lost, of course, you can always ask questions on the, either on their own repository or on the ImageSC forum where um, people are answering um, uh, questions also about scikit-image. Okay, so this is a very, very important uh, package and it will be used throughout all the notebooks and you will see it used in different ways. So um, you will become familiar with it if you, if you go through, through the material. Then we need a package to plot images. As I was saying, we use matplotlib. It's one of the oldest plotting libraries. It's very widely used. Um, it works again with numpy arrays. So you just can just pass a numpy array and plot it. Like this image, image here is a numpy array and it displays this image. In this course, it's used in an extremely minimal way. So we only plot images. Sometimes we plot two images or a histogram, uh, but we do it in a very, very minimalistic way. So there is a notebook about matplotlib in the course. Uh, you should have a look at it if you don't understand what is done in the, in the notebook. So sometimes I am creating uh, maybe a subplots and you might wonder, okay, how does it work? So you can consult the plotting notebook um, that, that I made to, to just show how it is used within this course. Okay. There are other multiple other plotting libraries uh, for more data plotting, uh, which are easier to use than matplotlib. Um, the advantage of matplotlib is that it gives you full control over how the, your pictures should look like. If you need to do a, a public, um, an image for a publication, you need to conform to some settings, you will be able to implement uh, virtually any, anything. But again, this is going to be very superficial. Okay, so these are the three main ones that you're going to, to see in the, in, the, in the material. And then there are a series of other ones uh, that are going to be used mostly in specific notebooks where I uh, try to illustrate how to, how to use them. Um, so you have a full list here with the links. Um, I will just go have a few slides where I can just illustrate how they work. So the first one is Napari. So Napari is a very recent software that has been developed um, to do uh, rendering, 3D rendering, volumetric rendering. It's very powerful and very user-friendly. Um, so you can create this kind of very advanced renderings of multi-dimensional plots. Uh, and you have this interface that allows you to uh, interact with your data. It's very easy to add custom, um, uh, custom interactions with this window. Um, and it has received, uh, I think lots of people are very enthusiastic about that software because it was a bit missing, a good uh, 3D render, uh, a complete render was a bit missing in the Python world. And so I think people are very enthusiastic about this. There is one drawback and you see that this opens a specific window. And so this means that, um, and it relies on a specific package to, to do the rendering. So this will only work if you install everything locally. So the, the, the Napari part will not work either on Binder or on Google Collab. So if you want to test it out, uh, you should install it on your computer. There is also, a, a, I think, a client that you can open um, separately uh, and, um, and use it um, even without notebooks. But you can use it uh, uh, without notebooks. Uh, I really encourage you to, to, to discover this. It's a, a great addition to the, to the Python world. Then there is a uh, track by. So there is one notebook where I show how to do tracking of cells in a time-lapse movie. It has been originally developed for particle tracking, um, but uh, it can be adapted to any, any other problem. It's very user-friendly. So the functions are very easy to use and um, very intuitive. It's based on pandas. So if you're not um, completely familiar with pandas, you, you might have to, to read a bit about this. I give explanations in the notebook about what Pandas uh, is. So Pandas is implementing data frames. If you know R, for example, it's very similar to data frames in R. And it's very simple to use at this level. So you, you will, exp if you explore that notebook, you will uh, um, discover how to use min minimal uh, Pandas. Uh, it has uh, TrackPy also implements uh, spot detection. So if you have a problem with you to do spot detection, you can do everything in TrackPy, the spot detection, the tracking. It has also numerous features to clean up tracks. Uh, you can remove tracks. 
there are lots of options when you do the tracking in terms of uh, the algorithms that you want to use. So it's a great software and um, uh, I think more and more people also are, are using it uh, because it also kind of came out of its own world, which was more uh, physics and biophysics based. Then another 3D rendering uh, renderer, which is IPy Volume. Um, uh, so this is also a great renderer and it purely uh, uh, works in the browser. So it exploits the browser technology. So you can really use it in your browser and this will work uh, on Binder. Uh, it still doesn't work on, on Google Collab, I think, because um, Google has some limitations on what, you, what you're allowed to display. But if you try this on Binder, it will definitely work. You can plot volumes, you can plot scatter plots, uh, meshes, lots of uh, things. You can even make movies. And you can interface it with another library, which is called IPy Widgets, which allows you to create uh, interactive uh, windows. And finally, you can export this view as a HTML file. So you can just say a figure, save my figure as HTML, and you will end up with, on your computer an HTML file that you can embed then in a website or anywhere else uh, as a demo, for example, or as, a, uh, as an illustration. So this is really a great feature of iPyVolume. It's, to customize, it's a bit more complicated than uh, Napari. So Napari is very user-friendly and you have all these controls to change colors and things. Um, this uh, requires uh, more programming and so a deeper understanding of, IP, IP volume, uh, of how IPy volume is, is working. But you can do basic plotting uh, very easily. It just if you want to customize it, it's going to require a bit more work. IPy widget is this library that allows you to create uh, this kind of uh, uh, interactive um, applications. Uh, so there is a, a, a tiny bit about IPy volume, I think in the notebook where I explain how to import images and how to display them. So you can create buttons, you can create lists and sliders, you can really create these kind of uh, applications. And so those will live in a notebook, uh, but you can, if you want, you can render them independently of the notebook uh, with another service, which is called Walla. Okay, this is beyond this course, this is not covered in this course, but I really like this, this application. I think it's a, it's a great application. So you can really create interactive applications. So this, you see that this was also running on my binder. Um, the demo is also on GitHub if you want to have a look at it. So you can create an app that then people can use uh, without having to touch any notebook or knowing any, uh, uh, anything about programming. It's really a web app, a bit like you would do a, a shiny app uh, in R. And you, um, yes, uh, IPy widget is also used by other packages like IPy volume. Finally, uh, we are going to are going to briefly show uh, in in, two, in one notebook two uh, segmentation applications that have become uh, popular. Uh, one of them is re very very recent. Uh, it's called Cellpose. I think there is not even a, a, a final publication on it. Uh, you can find it on the Bio Archive, I think. Uh, but they have a GitHub account. They even have a, uh, um, a web page that you see here where you can upload a, an image and test it on your own image before installing everything. And it has been trained. So it's a detection algorithm, a segmentation algorithm that has, it segments cells and nuclei. And it has been trained on a very large data set of very different kinds of images. So it's very versatile. Um, I see continuously people posting on, on Twitter like uh, how this is amazing. It worked out of the box on their image that was completely different uh, from what uh, Cellpose expects. I have tried it myself. It's honestly very, very impressive. And so you can run it as an application on your computer or you can uh, include it in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Python, in your own Python code or in a, in a JuPython notebook. And this is what I'm illustrating uh, very shortly in, 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 uh, in this notebook. So you can really run um, cell pose in a notebook if you want to integrate it into your, into your pipeline. Another one which is very similar and which is a bit older, which is Stardist. Um, you heard about Stardist in one of the previous lectures by the, the developers themselves. Um, as cell pose, it's implementing an algorithm which is uh, uh, a bit um, it, much smarter than what standard uh, deep learning approaches are doing. 
so there are adding uh, features, specific features to detect objects. In this case, uh, they are um, using uh, uh, a solution to segment st uh, what they call star convex objects. So if you imagine a star, it's uh, uh, an object where all control points can be, are accessible from a single point within the object. And so exploiting some mathematics around this, uh, they combined this with deep learning and uh, uh, provided this, uh, this software that can segment not just nuclei, but any kinds of objects which are um, star, uh, star convex objects. Um, so you can retrain, so there, there is a trained um, um, version of these algorithms that they trained also using a, a database of nuclei. And so if you have an image, images with nuclei, uh, fluorescence nuclei, you can try it on your, on your in, own data set. If you have a very different data set, you can retrain it. So there are instructions on their, on their website on how to do the new training. Uh, if you want to use this, if you go through a notebook and see, okay, this looks interesting. Again, it's very basic. If you want to know more, I really strongly encourage you to go and watch the, the course that they gave. I put the link here uh, of the course that is available now um, on YouTube. They have also material on their GitHub repository to show how uh, the system works and how you can run it. And they actually also use Google uh, Collab Notebook. So I hope this course will help you if you watched that training and had no idea what the Google Collab Notebook was, maybe this uh, uh, present course here will help you understand it a bit better. Finally, the last package is PyImageJ. Um, it's a package that allows you to mix uh, Fiji and Python. So for example, if you wrote a macro in Fiji, uh, and you want to integrate this with some kind of uh, further data analysis that you want to do, you can integrate that in a notebook. So Fiji is not, I think, that great to do uh, the data analysis part and the plotting part. Uh, I don't think that many people use it for that. It's absolutely great for, for the image processing part. <clears throat> but uh, notebooks and Python really shine in the data analysis part, or R if you want. Uh, and so you can basically transfer a macro inside a notebook and execute it and recover the output and create a plot, for example. And so then you have, again, integrated your whole analysis pipeline in, in a single notebook. So when you run this, it downloads Fiji for you, or you can uh, use your local Fiji. So there are different ways of doing this. You can also use plugins that you installed in your local Fiji version. Um, and I was, as I was saying, you can reuse macros. There are lots of things you can do. Uh, again, I put the links in that notebook to the original repository. There are many, um, uh, notebooks already provided by the developers of PyImageJ, uh, so you can really explore it. Just know that you can also use notebooks to do purely Fiji uh, uh, Java stuff, so you can really program your, uh, your routines uh, from notebooks if it's an environment that fits you. So there is a lot of uh, interaction there, and I think it's a good thing that this world gets a bit mixed, uh, along a bit what um, uh, for example, Robert Haase does with uh, Klige, where which is uh, available in different for different languages, but works everywhere the same. I think we should tend to mix uh, these different worlds uh, as um, as best as we can. And if you saw uh, this presentation about Klige, you also know that maybe that there is Klige Py, a version of uh, Klige that works in uh, in Python. And with that, uh, you, we ha you have a tour of all the contents that you might want to look at. So again, um, you can go through, you can go uh, to the repository at the end of this uh, webinar and you can browse through it. You can just read it uh, as uh, you would read a book or you can run it interactively. Binder is the easiest solution uh, because it doesn't require any install and works out of the box. Colab has these other features that I described, but don't forget to first download the data and put them in Google Drive. And uh, I hope uh, you will be able to at least try out some of the, uh, some of the uh, material. So I would really encourage you to go through the first set of notebooks until uh, number seven. This will cover most of the things you would do in a very simple Fiji macro, for example, like filtering, detecting objects, um, etc. And the other notebooks are on specific topics. So if there is one that uh, is appealing to you, you can just go in detail. The other one, you can just read them to have an, uh, an idea of uh, what they contain. 
And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, see you in a week. And I really want to thank all the developers of these open source tools, right? So I, there are many, many people who invest uh, countless hours uh, in these tools, but we can then use them. And uh, so I think one important point is don't forget to cite these uh, software packages in your articles. It also allows these people then to find money to fund this uh, development of, uh, of, um, of uh, tools. Also a big thank you to all the people who uh, release their data publicly. It makes this kind of courses easier because then you can exploit um, these data as examples. It's also in general, a very good way of you know, sharing uh, science. So a big thank you to all the people who take the time to do this. Uh, it's uh, painful sometimes to do, but uh, a thank you to these people too. And with that, we can maybe take one or two questions if there is time. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. And there is a poll maybe that you saw that asks if you plan to go through the material or not. Uh, just for me to know how much I should really go through the material next time or just answer questions, depending on what the feeling of people is. So is there any question, one or two questions? And we can take one or two minutes. Well, you have um, more than one or two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Alexis is asking main reasons you would recommend Python for an intensive Fiji user. Um, at some point, it's a question of taste, right? So if you, if you, if you are very used to, to Fiji, then uh, go for Fiji and write everything in Fiji. The, if, if you're not really a programmer, you would have to learn Java, you would have to learn how to program an entire uh, plugin. So there is a quite a lot of overhead if you want to do these things in Fiji. Here, you just need to import those packages and you can write your short pipeline in a function and you will come a long way. There, are, there is an example of a notebook where um, I, I show a full pipeline from imports to exporting an actual image uh, plot. And this would, take, would be a bit more difficult, I think, to do in Fiji. So I'm not a Fiji expert, so I, I don't know in detail, but I think in, in particular, the reason I would use notebooks is this feature that you can integrate everything, right? So Python is very good for the data science part, also through Pandas, uh, to do plots. So if you really need that, uh, I think it's a very nice integrated way of, of doing this. But as I was saying, the, the best thing, if you want to mix these two things, so you can use this PyMHA, for example, and use the pieces of Fiji that you, you really like uh, in, in Python and, and uh, yeah. Okay, we have some <clears throat> specific questions like which package would you recommend to select and work with a Roy on an image? Or is it possible to do cytometry analysis in Python? I don't know. Uh, yeah, so for uh, Roy, so everything which is interactive, uh, I think this is really, the, as I would say, was for a long time the weak part of Python and the reason why Lots of people use Fiji and I use Fiji a lot when I have to do very interactive things uh, because drawing on images and things like this was for a long time very complicated. So today I would, I would definitely tell people to use Napari. So if you think you want to use Python, install Napari. There you can draw things, you can click, you can select regions, you can create all kinds of objects, of shapes, of labels. So it's very, very flexible. And so I would really encourage pe pe people to, to use Napari. I, it might, there might be, I think, a course coming up about uh, Napari, uh, maybe in, in, in the bio session. So just check out what, uh, what is going to be offered. Also, there is a question. <clears throat> and does cell phones run in 3D very large, like 50 gigabytes data sets with appropriate amount of hardware? So I didn't understand the first part of the question. Like, can you run it on huge 3D data sets? Ah, yeah, so, so the, the, how much you can run is, uh, you, uh, you mean in general or for Napari? Uh, this is about Napari. Okay, Napari. Uh, so, so cell, cell pose. Cell pose sorry. sorry? Cell pose. A cell pose. Oh, uh, yeah, you can run, basically, Jupyter is just an interface. And as I was saying, you can run it using a kernel that sits anywhere. So if you have a, a cluster that uh, has uh, 24 cores, you can run anything. And if you have enough RAM, uh, you can run anything via Jupyter, right? You don't need anything special. 
just as an so and cell pose you would you would also run it uh, you would create a loop and go through all your images uh, again <coughs> cell pose and stardist are machine learning based so if you don't use a gpu uh, you will wait until uh, the end of the universe to, to process all your your images so if you really want to do intensive use of cell pose and uh, stardist you run it on a gpu so that's that's the only thing that uh, that really matters uh, and yeah, just one, no, one note more <laughs> like napari has been redesigned also to handle very large images so if there, there is a technology behind uh, Napari, which is called Dask, that you can use, uh, that allows you to open as large files as as, as you want. So, yeah. Uh, as far as you know, do you think most Java plugins available in Fiji can be called from Python? Uh, this I didn't explore enough to tell you. I know that there are limitations in how they the plugins are written in what are the requirements that uh, the writers put there. I know it's possible at least for some, some of them, but I haven't explored this myself in detail. So I, I, I cannot uh, really tell you uh, lots of details on this. Uh, but I'm happy to look into it if people have specific questions. This would be a great thing to show next time, for example. Um. Do you know specific packages for 3D point cloud rendering? Uh, for this, you can use uh, IPy volume, for example, or you can use Napari. So one of the two, those two will render like scatter points with, with shapes that you can choose. And so this, this works uh, without problem. And about cytometry, do you know some libraries for analysis in Python? Uh, not specifically for uh, cytometry. Um, no, not that comes uh, to the top of my mind. If anybody else has a, an idea, a specific idea for a specific plugin, <laughs> it doesn't come to my mind yet. Um, there is question I'm not familiar with. <clears throat> for video, is it only possible to work with using neck pi uh, this uh, how do you spell it n a c k pi y mm, no I, so i don't know that package i have no no idea <laughs> do you know how robust is pi image j because image j matlab is sometimes buggy uh no i as far as I tested, it works. Um, what I noticed is that on some versions of Fiji, there are, there are some issues. I put a specific version in, for example, in Binder to be sure that it would work. I think ImageJ and Python are quite stable, so I don't see why it should be particularly unstable. Of course, it's, this is a tool which is, I think, uh, still under development, so there might be some changes. The only thing which might be complicated is the installation because you need the uh, right Java and so if you want to install it, just go in PyImageJ repository and check out what they, what they suggest. Julien should just say uh, when we should stop overrunning the, the time. Well, I think there are some more specific questions already <clears throat> that we will probably answer in the offline in writing exactly and we can compile all these questions and look at them also in the, in the next session so i think in the, for the sake of time i think we can close here the, the question session and uh, so we'll be back next uh, wednesday i think same time same place <laughs> home and um, and looking forward to see all of you hopefully uh, again there so thanks for your attention. <laughs>